Hello and welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Packler. This is a chance for us to bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we will talk with two young philosophy professors who are driven to cultivate a deep faith in Jesus Christ through the pursuit of human reason. Before we get to that, though, we want to talk briefly with EWTN's Vice President for Programming and Production, Mr. Peter Gagnon. I want to talk to you about some pro-life programming coming up. What Absolutely. do you have in store for us? Well, obviously, this is a unique year. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, uh, some of the larger pro-life events that we've covered every year for, for many, many, many years have been either canceled or really scaled down. So. Um, but we are still going to go forward with, with a shorter version and a mix of live and virtual for uh, the March for Life. So on um, Friday, January 29th, we're going to offer coverage of the march. We're going to have a special uh, program leading up to their virtual rally that they're going to be providing that March for Life people are putting together. And then after that, there's going to be a, um, a march with a small group of pro-life um, leaders from around the country. And they are going to process through the streets of Washington to the Supreme Court. And, um, and so we, want to, we felt it was still very important to show that event, to participate in it. So we'll have coverage from our DC office. Our team up there will be providing um, interviews and, uh, and different commentaries from people for that mm -hmm. event. So people should, should tune in to, um, to that uh, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time on the 29th and, uh, and just continue to show our support because obviously it's, it's very important in, in the years coming up to just continue to support life. And, and as we have always done over the years around this time, we have a lot of pro-life programming on the network, so people should really tune in. We have yeah. University of Pro-Life Weekly is doing a lot of great interviews and mm -hmm. program hauling that. We have a, a program called Who's a Real Margaret Sanger? People need to know what her story is and what her background Absolutely. was. Absolutely. And people will be pretty shocked, I think, or they should be shocked to see what she really taught, what she really believed, and, I, and how this continued to be perpetuated today. I mean, there are people who still mm -hmm. receive, politicians and such, they receive the Margaret Sanger Award. I know. And they ought to be ashamed of themselves. This was a lady who was giving lectures about pro-family uh, uh, limitation and ending black yeah. folks. I mean, she wanted to eliminate the black race. Yeah. Oh, it's a really a horrible history. It so, is. So, it is. so, so should try to tune into that program. We also have um, the Unplanned movie. Uh, we oh, have good. a, a yeah, yeah. behind-the-scenes uh, special on that and how it was put together, uh, so that's very good. And then we finally have a program also called 40, looking at the 40 years of abortion and, and really uh, the horrific impact it has had on Absolutely. lives. And, um, and so go to EWTN.com forward slash pro-life, and you can see all the lineup of all our pro-life programming this month. So, Excellent. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you, Peter. Appreciate Absolutely. it very much. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with tonight's program and guests, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We have two guests tonight, both of whom are converts to the Catholic faith, and both of them work in a profession where many of their colleagues think that religious faith is irrational. There are a pair of college philosophy professors who have compiled a book of fascinating testimonies and conversion stories of different well-known philosophers whom God drew to himself and to the church through reason guided by grace. So please welcome the editors of the book Faith and Reason, Philosophers Explain Their Turn to Catholicism. 
is by Dr. Brian Bizong and Dr. Jonathan Fuquay. Gentlemen, thanks for welcome. Having us. Thank Good you. to have you Good to be here, here with us. Good to have you. And thank you for writing this book. Um, you know, a lot of people have children or grandchildren that are going to colleges and losing their faith. This is the other direction, people coming to faith. Let's take a look, first of all, what is going on in the colleges that induces so many to either lose faith or to at least become nons. That's, that's now one of the biggest groups in the country. They're not committed to any group. They're non-Christian, non-atheist. They don't know what they are. What, what is leading to this? You want to start? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's a combination of two things. I think one thing in the academy, it's very popular. The dominant view actually is that faith and reason are in conflict with one another, mm -hmm. that you can't be a person of faith and a rational person. You, it's either one or the other. Right. You pick reason or you pick faith. And in, in, the, uh, in the academic arena, you want to be a person, a rational person, a person of reason, a person who follows the evidence where it leads, mm -hmm. a, a person like Socrates, like Socrates, who's willing to follow the argument wherever it led. And um, when, you, when you go into that environment and these experts who have PhDs and write books and articles, um, when they tell you implicitly or explicitly that faith and reason are not consistent and that you have to pick, that puts young uh, Christian men and women who are in college in a very difficult position. Hmm. I think the, the other side of that coin is that I think in the church, we need to do a better job of catechizing our, our young people and our parents in the riches of the Catholic intellectual tradition. I think it's the most intellectually stimulating and rich tr intellectual tradition in the world with some of the greatest minds who've ever walked the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And we're, 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 we need to do a better job of passing that heritage on to our young people so that when they go to university, they're equipped to handle the intellectual challenges they're gonna face. Yeah, I, I think we, you're right. We don't tell the story of the founder of genetics right. being an Augustinian monk. Mm -hmm. the, in the, the discoverer of the Big Bang Theory being Father Georges Lemaitre and wide variety, and as much conflict as Galileo had with the Pope, he didn't lose his faith at all. He was still very much a Catholic. Uh, he just had to learn to stop calling the Pope nasty names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to add to that, I think a lot of college students are facing uh, the very first struggles with their faith. It's, it's like birds that are out of the nest, right? Mm -hmm. on, every, on every matter, uh, personal responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, friendships. And so as they begin to try to stretch their wings and become full-grown adults, the fact that their professors may, um, whether explicitly or implicitly, dismiss the faith as some relic of the past, um, combined with a lack of direct supervision from their parents, strong passions that make them want to go party. Uh, and so, you know, the, the combination is just toxic, uh, yeah. toxic for faith. It, and it, it's even at the universities where it, where it shouldn't be like this, unfortunately, many of the, the great um, texts in the, in the Christian intellectual tradition are no longer commonly read and studied in many degree programs at many universities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the rare student who's read Augustine's Confessions. It's mm -hmm. the rare student who's really studied the thought of Aquinas or Anselm or Bonaventure or Suarez. Mm -hmm. And so they should be getting exposed to the riches of, of the Western intellectual tradition might give them the resources even there to push back a little bit and engage at a deeper level with their faith, but that just doesn't happen at many of our universities anymore, sadly. No. They've no, devolved no, no. into glorified trade schools. Uh, I can still remember that in eighth grade, Sister Ida had told my class, you ought not die without reading Augustine's Confessions. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most read books in the history of Western culture. Uh, it's, I think it's like right after the Bible. 
It's right, what top two or three books, including the Bible. And that people don't know it anymore is a great tragedy. Yeah. But it also means they're not taking the serious engagement with faith right. and reason. Because Augustine had to reason his way as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got that uh, problem. But now you've got some very serious philosophers who did come to faith and you tell their stories um, and their stories are not easy stories well oh I just sort of felt one day that the apple hit my head and I felt oh I think there's God no they were struggling and they really grappled with the questions of life what made you do this book first of all what was well, first of all, it was just a great love for our Catholic faith and a desire to uh, make known the many stories. I mean, the, the public perception of philosophy professors is that we're atheists. I mean, the, right. the popular movie uh, of God is Not Dead has the atheist professor, um, the atheist philosophy professor mm -hmm. attacking a student's belief. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that philosophy professors are uh, normally antagonistic to faith, it's true. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's not rational. Uh, and in fact, as people begin to push the, the fundamental answers given by contemporary atheistic philosophy, they see them wanting. But, I mean, these are the, the college students of yesteryear who abandoned their faith in college, like many other college students today, and who were left with the sort of pieces to pick up. But as they did, they began to discover the Catholic faith. And so, having been exposed to repeated stories like this, it's... I mean, it's just a, a, a wealth that you want to share with people. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, um, I, I see this as a great counterpoint to another book called Architects of the Culture of Death. Mm. And it, it gives biographies of those philosophers who helped develop the destruction of Western society from the inside. Mm. Um, you, on the other hand, are presenting the positive counterpoint. This is what happens. Uh, one of the very powerful stories that you tell is of Candace Vogler. Mm. That, uh, tell us a little bit about her. Uh, it's it, where to start. Candace Vogler is an extremely prolific, well-regarded uh, female philosopher. Uh, she's really at the top of the field. Uh, she writes in a wide range of issues completely unbeknownst to the professional world, she was sexually abused by her father from at a very young age. Um, oh, and it, it, she describes his behavior changing towards her as she became uh, potentially pregnant. But the sexual abuse a apparently didn't end until she left home entirely. And her mother completely abandoned her to this abuse. She, she was not ignorant. Um, her mother knew all about it. Um, in, in that you know, uh, having known people in those kinds of situations, that is such a profound experience of betrayal of the most basic love you should have, your father and mother. Yeah, but hers is a, is a story whose arc focuses on forgiveness. And it, it's a story that, although many of the stories are highly, I mean, not highly cognitive, but they're cognitive. It's it's reason playing this this central by, by role. By cognitive, what you mean? I mean um, that that it was reasons, it was considerations, and the um, the difficulties in explaining the world or central parts of the Christian message right. without the Catholic faith. Right. Here, it was a lived experience of the necessity of the Catholic faith that pulled her. The the understanding of mm -hmm. a world broken, torn, burned down that mm -hmm. it's not going to get any better without forgiveness. And yeah. so her story, I mean, it's one of the most powerful of the, of the volume, in my opinion. It's a beautiful capstone to the book because as Brian mentioned, a lot, of the, a lot of the other chapters are heavily focused on the arguments in favor of Catholicism and how Catholicism speaks to the intellects and need for truth. Mm -hmm. And her story has elements of that, but it also illustrates how Catholic Christianity speaks to the need of the heart for right. love and forgiveness. And, and her, her own life and career as a Catholic philosopher beautifully illustrates the, um, the unity between the intellect and the will and how in Jesus Christ we find the ultimate good and the ultimate truth. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, um, 
you know, something that, again, for such a uh, philosopher who is very well known uh, in the philosophy world, I, you know, you wouldn't see her on the uh, evening talk shows. Uh, <laughs> she's not going to be a guest there. Uh, she's uh, far more important than that. She's, you know, doing very important and serious work, but this conversion is on that level. Whereas the rest, as you said, the rest of the other stories are much more dealing with the problems that life poses for the atheist. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and this is something, a lot of times, people think that the atheists pose a problem to the believers that we can't figure out. Yeah. That's their bread and butter. But once they are in that world, they run into, they run into problems they cannot cope with. What were some of the issues that you saw uh, that they, they had to, that forced serious philosophy thinkers who took ideas very seriously to say, this is irresolvable. How, who were some of the, was some of the pro, what were some of the problems that you saw? Well, Jay's essay is, is one of the things I was just thinking, thinking of. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so Jay's essay involves um, basically him struggling with the nihilism, the nihilism that uh, was engendered. So just well, first a, a lack of meaning. Talk, what is nihilism? Yeah, so it's, it's just this, this view that there, there is no objective value in the world, that there's no real meaning to our, uh, our existence. And so, you know, whatever we're going to, to get out of it is something that we're putting into it. There's, there's no ultimate purpose or meaning in life. And, and, and nihil comes from the Latin word meaning nothing. Yeah. And that's sort of what they sense, that there's just nothing there, that they, they, they feel, they really do uh, think, and I, and I would say feel, the emptiness of the world, the nothingness of the world. Right. And, and this has become, philosophers have actually begun, uh, began to uh, turn this into an argument, but Jay's was not an argument, it was a lived, uh, he, to live in the state of nothingness, in, in the belief that the world around you is essentially meaningless and, and devoid of purpose, it, you can't live like that for long. And uh, he had a, a crisis of conscience. Basically, the, the crisis of conscience was, ironically, that he felt uh, morally bound not to give this nihilism to his college students. As a, a newly minted PhD and professor at the University of Texas at Austin, he felt compelled not to push onto his students the destructive, uh, you know, lived experience that he himself was facing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there are other parts of the story the, uh, that... The, the part of the story, his story I was thinking of was that he realized that as an atheist, he couldn't really account for the reliability of reason. Mm -hmm. Why should he trust his own mind? When, when the human mind, if the, if the human mind is a product of a blind, random process that doesn't care about truth. Right. If the human mind is not ordered to the truth, if there's no uh, purpose or goal directedness about the human mind, what philosophers call teleology mm -hmm. from the Greek telos for purpose, mm -hmm. then why think the human mind is, reliable, is a reliable instrument when it comes to getting the truth? And so re really I think what you see in his story is that he, he eventually realizes that faith has to save reason from itself, given a naturalistic worldview. See, this is one of the problems for reason. If you, uh, I, I look at reason, the ability to, and by that, just so folks understand, we mean the ability to think logically. Reason takes you, by certain rules, step by step from point A to point B. I compare it to a ladder. Once you get on the ladder, you take it step by step, you go from one point up to the point at the head of the ladder. Mm. That's the way reason works when you're skilled at it. And that's a good thing. But where you get to depends on where you put the ladder in the first place. If you put a ladder up against a blank wall, reason will take you to a blank wall. Yeah, right. That, in fact, is logical, <laughs> right? As uh, Spock would say.
Yeah, and Aristotle famously said, and, and Aquinas repeated this sentiment, that a small error in the beginning leads to big er big error in the end. Sure. Yeah. And so if you start out thinking that matter is all that exists, well, th if that's the first rung on the ladder, how do you account for meaning? How do you account yeah. for value? How do you right. account for truth? These things are not reducible mm -hmm. to materiality. And so you, you either have to abandon these things and you're left with nihilism, skepticism, uh, or you have to try to reduce them somehow to the a physical reality and that, that just doesn't work. Right. And, and even apart from meaning, you can't even say that there's a physical reality to numbers. Right. Numbers are not a physical reality. That's right. right. How do you, if you have only a physical universe, how do you come up with number as something that applies to measurement everywhere in the universe? Right. Yeah, it's the universal language. Yeah. 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 And, and so this is, uh, you know, a problem, and, and that's where he ran into his difficulty. How does mm -hmm. he explain that? Right, but it's not just um, uh, the, the crisis of existence or these existential crises. I mean, uh, Ed Fazer's essay is, is a wonderful illustration of how... In fact, we had Edward Fazer on the show. Mm. Yeah, he's, he was a guest here once because his work is so impressive. It yeah. is. And, uh, yeah, yeah he's, he's really uh, one of the hot Thomists right now. Um, but he, he wasn't always Thomist. Well, he was an uh, atheist. He was an atheist, right. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he began to try to want his philosophy classes to be more interesting, and he thought that he wasn't doing a very good job of making the arguments for God compelling, and if he's going to make it a debate, a boxing match between two views, well, he's got to make at least, uh, he's got to make mo both partners equally uh, matched up, and so he wanted to bolster the arguments. Turns out he became persuaded of the arguments. See, and this is one of the problems that I think goes on in a number of the philosophy classes and other classes in college, that the professors do not have enough honesty to be able to let the Christian arguments and the Jewish arguments for the existence of God. There were fine Jewish philosophers Mm -hmm. as well as fine Christian philosophers mm -hmm. and fine Muslim philosophers right. who disagreed on certain points, but they all could deal with the existence of God. Yeah. And I think the best of them was Thomas, yeah, uh, right. uh, 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 St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, but presenting it honestly and with the full force of its reason instead of dismissively where you say, oh, now you, now you can't take full Thomas seriously because he's using medieval ideas. So right. nobody can take that seriously. Right. And, and On what basis? I right. mean, numbers were even older than medieval. You still <laughs> use them. Sure. Right. And, and, and Edward Fazer's essays, he, he discusses in there the fact that Many, many even professional philosophers aren't themselves that familiar with the classical arguments for right. God's existence. That's right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it, that's, that's really, the, that's because of their own training. They, they, weren't, trained to, they weren't trained in the, in the metaphysics of, say, Aristotle or Aquinas. So when they read the five ways of Aquinas, they don't really quite understand what's going on. No. Uh, to understand Aquinas' five ways, you've got to understand Aquinas' underlying metaphysics, his philosophy of the basic structure of reality. Yeah. And if you don't understand that, you can't properly explain the five ways to your, to your students. And so the way uh, Aquinas, if, he's, if, if Aquinas' arguments for God's existence are even discussed at all, it's very common to set him up, shoot him down, mm -hmm. without ever discussing the background metaphysics. And so the students end up not even understanding the arguments. And that's because the professor, him or herself, doesn't really understand the arguments. Many professors are just smart enough to have reached their conclusions in grad school, but are now so close-minded not to be willing to climb the ladder of logic. Yeah. And so reason takes humility. You know, it's it, what you climb up to may scare you. It may change your mind. It may, uh, you know, imbalance everything else that you had thought was settled. And many philosophy professors who in grad school have come to their hardened materialism, their view that the material world's all there is, or their hardened atheism are now years later, unwilling to change their mind. Uh, and that's a fundamentally irrational attitude that you do not see in these philosophers who are willing to change the mind, even as adults. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things I liked about Fazer, uh, his book, uh, The Last Superstition, uh, I was a philosophy major undergrad. I had a double major, one in philosophy, one in theology. And nobody made clear, and I said this to Dr. Fazer, uh, nobody made as clear to me the importance of the first Greek philosophers, the, the ones that we call the pre-Socratics, that came before Socrates. Mm -hmm. Nobody made as clear to me the, um, the significance and, and purpose and very important uh, role that they played in setting the basic questions as Fazer did. But he built step by step right. an understanding of philosophy that, you know, then you say, oh, St. Thomas comes from this whole tradition of real thought. Right, right. And only uh, silly people or semi-competent people don't take this seriously. Right, right. And when you look at the history of philosophy, you see, Al Brian mentioned correctly, today, you know, a majority of philosophers are secular. That's not the case historically. Right. No. You go back and look at Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, you go right down through the Christian medieval tradition, the Jewish, the Arabic. Mm -hmm. I mean, most even into early modern philosophy, people like Descartes, mm -hmm. Leibniz, Locke, these, these people were not atheists. Right. Kant? Kant, right. Kant was not an atheist. No. So the, the, the predominance of atheism is an extremely recent phenomenon. Today's secular philosophers stand out for their, their extreme minority position within the discipline considered historically. And even when you, uh, when you consider uh, philosophy broadly, atheism is the predominant trend, but when you narrowly focus on people whose specialty is analyzing arguments for and against God, within that narrow range of philosophy of religion, uh, it's actually predominantly theist, people yeah. who believe that God exists. Yeah. Yeah. And so the people who, w even within contemporary philosophy, as secular as it is, the people who begin to really do work on uh, arguments for and against God predominantly do believe in God. That's right. mm -hmm. I, I think in a lot of ways, philosophers are influenced by Karl Marx's dissertation okay. on Hegel. Um, in 1847, that's where he first wrote that religion is the opiate of the peoples. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of philosophers are afraid, well, no, 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 I don't want to uh, be religious if it's just opium. Right. right. Whereas I like to point out given the way that the election went this past November in Oregon and has gone in many other states over the past few years that where they legalize various drugs, mm -hmm. that now opiates are the opiates of the people. Right. Yeah. And you know that you know that it, the it lack of religion like is making people right. so superficial right. yeah. that they're willing to use drugs to deal with the problems that really bother them yeah. instead of letting the questions arise and confronting the questions. Right. right. It almost seems like secularism is now the opiate of the people. Right. Yeah. Because it gives I, them a pass now it, to actually take it gives literal them a pass. Opiates. Instead of pursuing <laughs> virtue and holiness and, and trying to surrender my life to God, I can just, I don't have to master myself. I don't have to become virtuous. I don't right. have to master my appetites. I can just become a slave to my passions and appetites. Perpetual That's what, adolescence. Perpetual adolescence, right. 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 ignoring the big questions. Yeah. And getting high. Right, right, right. right. You know, it, it's one last thing. I don't know if you were aware of this or not. I, I, you didn't mention in your book, I don't think. But um, the great 20th century philosopher, Jean Paul Sartre, also believed that everything was nothingness and meaningless. Right. Yeah. And he struggled not to commit suicide his whole right. life. Right. right. And then when he was totally disillusioned, he went to Soviet Union. And after defending Stalin, of all people, <laughs> and so many other things, he went and he saw, oh, my word, what the propaganda said wasn't propaganda. It was true. This is a horrendous mistake. Mm -hmm. On his deathbed, he came back to his Catholic faith. Hmm. And he, a Dominican priest gave him the, uh, heard his confession, gave him the last rites, regularized his marriage with Simone de Beauvoir, and he died peacefully wow. a Catholic. I didn't know wow. that. I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. I remember I had a colleague when I 
was teaching high school in uh, the late 70s. Uh, he came in the day after Sartre died. And he was doing his dissertation on Sartre. He liked Sartre. And he came in broken heart. He said, Sartre died a Catholic. <laughs> he was disappointed. <laughs> it's oh, wow. hard to see which was more disappointing for <laughs> <I> him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a little break. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. So please stay with us and give us a call if you have some questions to understand these questions, these issues of how thinking and reason helps bring you to know God and know Him deeply. All right, we are talking about a book called Faith and Reason, Philosophers Explain Their Turn to Catholicism, edited by Brian B. Zong and Jonathan Fuquay. This is available at EWTNRC.com. It is item number 6420, 6420, and it's... Uh, uh, Got a number of people a lot of you already know about. Story of Peter Kraft and some other great folks. Uh, and we mentioned earlier uh, Edward Fazer, who had been on this show in the past. So this is uh, a good topic, as uh, especially uh, e soon enough, this COVID deal will be coming to a conclusion. And a lot of your high school seniors will be getting ready to go to college. And they need to be able to prepare for this. This is something that's very important. You don't just send unprepared kids into a philosophy class. Uh, in that uh, movie, God is Not Dead, which I recommend, by the way, uh, that it would not be a bad movie for a lot of high school seniors to get as a graduation present. Mm. But don't just give it to them. Sit down and watch it with them. Watch it with your students. So they get an idea that there are professors like that. Right. There are professors that will attack your faith, won't help you think through it, will not help you find the real arguments in favor of the uh, existence of God and then refute it because usually they can't. They just don't know those arguments. They can't refute it. Right. And they just end up being propagandists. Right. That's too common. Um, I remember a case in Florida where a professor had all the students write the name Jesus on a piece of paper then put it on the floor, stand up, and then everybody stomp on it. <laughs> wow. The only kid who wouldn't do it was a Mormon kid, and he got kicked out of the class wow. and given an F. He had a sue to, to have that rescinded. This is sometimes what students are up against, and they don't want to put up with it. Right. Yeah. Thank, thankfully, most, most professors are not quite as combative as the professor in that movie, but the ideas that that professor in that movie articulates are very common among the, the professors at many universities. Yes. And I think of um, the, the book, The Atheist Guide to Reality, by the Duke University philosophy professor, Alex Rosenberg, who says in that book, we won't even consider whether theism might be true. We already know that it's false. Yeah. And that's the attitude. Instead of diving into the arguments, as you mentioned, we just dismiss them out of hand because we, we already know the conclusions can't possibly be right. Right. And this is one of the best illustrations of how the Catholic philosopher is more rational than the atheist. Yeah. Because the, the atheist is not willing to consider deep and important questions. They've closed their minds to them. They've come to these conclusions prejudiciously. And the Catholic philosopher is willing to open every door to, to ask every question. And they know that God's the origin of all truth. And so it, there's nothing uncomfortable, nothing off limits. 
See, that's one of the things I've said many times on this program as I hear stories about cancel culture preventing free speech on college campuses, that there was more freedom of speech and freedom of thought in the medieval universities of Europe than there is in the elite colleges today. Yeah. At the University of Paris, you could argue anything, but you also were going to be up against counter arguments right. and you had to defend yourself on the basis of logic. Right. Right. And that is not permitted anymore. Well, it, they even had sessions where students could ask the most absurd questions of right. their professors, and the professors would be, as, as it were, obliged to answer them as best they can. Uh, you don't get the opportunity to ask every question uh, right. today. Even asking questions is going to out you as uh, lacking sufficient wokeness. Yeah. yeah. And this is something that, you know, I, I can remember even in the 80s, there was a philosophy professor at the university who was ridiculing people of faith. This is at a Catholic university. Mm. And he was doing it to Jesuit scholastics, just mocking them in class in front of all the students for their faith. Mm. I was really outraged because even though I'm, I'm a, was a theology professor, you don't do that to students. Right. The goal of education is to lead them, you know, from their ignorance toward knowledge, but help them learn to think right. and research. Right. And I, I, I was, you know, I didn't have tenure myself, but that becomes a problem for professors. Right. If you don't have tenure, then you're limited to what you can say or believe right. out loud. Although it does illustrate the, the merits of a good Catholic education, mm -hmm. right? Because there it's not indoctrination. Right. Uh, the point is actually, I mean, we see that truth is out there. We see that reason can access it. Uh, and we want, because we care about others in charity and love of, you know, our fellow human beings, right. we want to see them flourish, to know the truth. We don't just want another soldier in uh, the war that we're fighting, the indoctrination. Yeah, yeah. Propaganda is not conversion. Right. Right. You know, that's, in, in, propaganda has been invented uh, by atheist governments. Right. right. You know, it, it, at many of our Catholic universities, you can get, a, you can get a, in, in many ways, a better education, I think, than you can often at, at secular universities. Right. Yeah. Because our students will read Aquinas, they'll read Augustine, they'll, they'll read Aristotle and Plato, but they'll also read Hume. They'll read Rousseau. Absolutely. They'll read Locke. They'll, they'll read Kant. They'll, yeah. they'll, they'll read contemporary philosophers who are secular. We want to show them all the possible answers to every question, and we're not afraid of that because all truth is God's truth. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And faith and reason ultimately don't conflict. The author of faith is also the author of reason, God in each case. Right. So if reason is used properly, it will, le it will lead in the direction of faith. And so we're not afraid of that, that, um, that, edu that full, well-rounded education on all sides of a question. We don't need to tamp down certain lines of inquiry because we know all of them, if they end properly, will end in God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I, I remember quite well in the, uh, college philosophy classes, uh, you know, there, there were, these were some of the upper level ones um, because I was a major, but, you know, showing us that you cannot even prove that logic is logical hmm. because you'd have to use logic to do so. And then to prove something by the thing itself is against the rules of logic, it's tautology. So there's a certain ultimate level at which you have to accept logic and reason on faith that's right. and faith alone. Right. Well, and human nature <laughs> right. gives us these intuitions, right? G yeah. Human nature gives us these first principles. But if we, are, if we treat our human nature as suspect, as the result of blind, chaotic forces, well, why even endorse the first principles? Mm -hmm. And then where are we going to be? And this is why Jay had the crisis. Right. Uh, 
it, it, there's, a, there's a crisis, this, there's this crisis on the subjective side of why trust human reason if it comes from a blind chaotic process. But there's also a, a, a crisis on the objective side. Why think the world is an orderly, rational place? Why think that, as, uh, as uh, people following St. Thomas like to put it, why think that being is intelligible? Why think that there's a match between our minds and reality? That's also an act of faith. But it's an act of faith that only makes sense if God exists. And so we see that really the, the, the intellectual precondition, preconditions needed for science are actually theological in nature. That there's a God who is the source of the intelligibility of the world and the human mind and has, who has designed a kind of fit between our minds and the world that makes science possible. I, you know, this is where, you know, my own field of uh, Old Testament studies can come in that science was started in places like Egypt and Babylon. They really did some fine work in mathematics and in astronomy. And there were some very basic inventions like the wheel. Uh, you know, that was invented in Mesopotamia. Um, no small idea. It sounds so simple, but Nobody ever invented a wheel in the Americas. Hmm. None of the Native Americans ever used wheels. It just wasn't part of the mentality. They didn't have roads. Didn't, wouldn't seem necessary. So there's great work that was done in Babylon and Greece and Egypt by the pagans. But they couldn't sustain it. Hmm. None of their science was sustained by their belief in the gods. Hmm. Because to study the sun could get the sun god mad at you. Right. <laughs> to study the wind or the moon would get those gods mad at you. Right. And you never knew when you were going to tick them off and they'd get back at you. Right. Whereas in the Bible, God created out of the chaos and he spoke everything into being. He said, let there be light and there was light and so on. And he always saw that it was good, but none of it was a God. None of it was a personality. Right. It was just a force of nature and human beings were created capable of understanding that. Mm -hmm. That worldview from Christianity has made science a sustainable reality. Right. You, can sus you can study science if you have no concern about ticking off the gods, <laughs> but just understanding other creatures that the one God made. That's a huge revolution in thought. Right. That's a question of whether Western Christendom can maintain it. Uh, now we're going back to shamanism and uh, other pagan practices. Right. And so who's to say whether uh, the forces of nature, so says the shaman, are not really personalistic forces and perhaps we should appease them. The Catholic philosopher has a lot more to say than that. Yeah. and, and the also, the belief in shamanism shows the point of G.K. Chesterton. When someone loses their faith in God, they don't believe in nothing. They'll believe in anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. We have a caller online. Hello, Chuck? Yeah, this is Chuck from uh, Georgia. Great, Chuck. What is your question? My question is for the doctors. Um, talking about St. Edith Stein, she was an atheist... Uh, philosopher, and she had a conversion just after reading to Teresa of Avila. And I just wanted to know if they came across any um, philosophers that had a hardcore conversion after reading a Catholic saint. And I'll hang up and listen. Thank you very much. So, were any of these philosophers that you, st you wrote about, were any of them influenced by a saint like Edith Stein? Not directly, but I should say that my daughter's named Edith after Edith Stein. So uh -huh. I have a great love for her and Teresa. Mm -hmm. But 
Uh, are you familiar with any stories that like Ignatius, like Edith Stein? Well, I, I was thinking in this book specifically that um, Edward Fazer and Jay Bujashevsky and Candace Vogler were all influenced by St. Thomas Aquinas, right. mm -hmm. by his yeah. philosophical system. Mm -hmm. um, but, but more by the philosophy than by the, the heroic sanctity. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's... Um, but Edith Stein's work was on sympathy. It was on being affected by others, and so it was entirely appropriate. E even that, which seems so, as it were, sentimental, was itself the process of very careful reasoning. I mean, she was the promising student uh, of Husserl. She, she was superior to Heidegger um, and favored uh, over Heidegger. And so her work was uh, monumental, important, and reading uh, Teresa of Avila, it was a culmination of, of her work on sympathy. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's so interesting. You know, a lot of folks don't know the name Edmund Husserl. He's not well-read in English. He, he was uh, a, a German philosopher, uh, Jewish himself, and he taught very famous students. Yeah like Martin Heidegger, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, and Edith Stein. Mm -hmm. And Edith Stein was Jewish. Heidegger became a Nazi. Right. And helped, you know, do a lot of harm to Jews. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those amazing things of going in these different directions that, um, you know, became very important, and still Heidegger was a very significant right. factor in the 20th century. Well, and it should say something of her um, great caliber of intellect that she was more favored over Heidegger, yeah. and yet where did, she, where did she spend her life? She did not get an endowed chair at a prestigious university in Europe. She became a cloistered Carmelite um, because she saw that as more promising, a greater fulfillment of her work than anything she could do in a, a public university. And at the time, Heidegger accepted a chancellorship hmm. for a university from Adolf Hitler. <laughs> you know, and he looked so more promising. Hmm. It's one of those great ironies. Um, it, and it, it, interestingly, you know, s sadly, many contemporary philosophers, at least, they they they've never probably read Teresa of Avila. They've never read Saint John of the Cross. They've they've never read the mystical literature, uh, the, the literature about the saints and the martyrs. It's not it's not part of the curriculum on which they were educated. But even more yeah. tragically, most Catholics haven't read those. Most Catholics haven't read those either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I think that would be part of Chuck's point in his question, that you know, encountering people whose lives are holy had a profound experience on the thought of Edith Stein and that it really was a transformative experience and eventually led to her being martyred, yeah. uh, you know, dying a martyr in uh, Auschwitz with other Jewish people. She, it was because she was Jewish, but she also was singled out like others in Holland who were converts to Catholicism from Judaism because the Dutch bishops had spoken against the Third Reich and excommunicated the Reich mm -hmm. and anybody associated with it. And they sought revenge and she suffered it. One thing before we go, how did you two meet? How did you become friends and, and write this book? Boiler up. Yeah, we, we, Brian and I were both PhD students uh, at Purdue University. Okay. And, and he was a little bit ahead of me, but our time overlapped a little bit. And uh, he, he converted ahead. He's always one step ahead of me. He, he came into the <laughs> church before I did. And um, I was in my own conversion. And both of you, by the way, have been on Marcus Grodice program. Yeah, the right. journey home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, journey home. And in my own conversion, I was, I would say, powerfully affected by conversion stories. I think right. the first conversion story I ever read was Augustine's Confessions. And I was very impressed. Here's this brilliant thinker uh, whose heart and mind are, are on fire for the truth and, and, and for the Lord. And he comes into the Catholic Church. And then I read some modern conversion stories, Rome Sweet Home by Scott Hahn, Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. And, and then uh, there was only really one written conversion story of a modern contemporary philosopher. And uh, eventually that was Francis Beckwith wrote a book about mm -hmm. his reversion mm -hmm. to Rome. 
And I thought after I came into the church that um, I knew of all these philosophers just from being in the philosophical community. I knew that there were many, many philosophers who had come into the church. And I thought if there was a book in which some of their stories could be displayed and the compatibility of faith and reason could be put on display, maybe that would help other people to see that you don't have to be irrational. <laughs> Yeah, you can be yeah. a person of reason and faith. But there's an embarrassment of riches. We we've got this book done, and you know, like uh, he and I were at a, a conference of the American Catholic Philosophical Association, and it's like you you can't walk three feet without bumping into four more converts. Right. And, and so throw a stone, you hit a convert. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so there's going to be volume two. <laughs> that's a good question. Maybe. Yeah. There could there could easily be several volumes. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> right. I don't think that that's a bad idea. Um, you know. This, because one of the things that people can get from this is how these folks converted and the issues they had might touch the experience of a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, great books of conversion like C.S. Lewis is Surprised by Joy touches a lot of people right. who say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And that's one of the advantages of this book. And I think, you know, a lot of people are afraid to go too far. They don't feel equipped to ask hard questions. Right. And so they know the questions are there. They're bothered by them. And yet at the same time, it's like uh, a chore around the house that you just think is too difficult for you. Yeah. So they put it off and they put it off. And reading academics who have perfect competency to begin to ask and answer these questions, I think it's invigorating for people. Yeah. Well, I find cleaning my room that way. <laughs> Again, the book is called Faith and Reason. Philosophers Explain Their Turn to Catholicism. It's edited by Brian Bizong and Jonathan Fuque. You can get this book at EWTNRC.com. It's item number 6420, 6420. And it'll help a lot, especially if you have students getting ready to go to college. Thank you both for studying philosophy and being professors and for getting this compilation to us and helping people to think. And I want to give all of you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you, and cause His face to shine upon you, lead you in all of your ways by His peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we can do this program plus what we're going to be doing to promote the issues of life and human dignity and all the other shows we do only because the network is brought to you by you. You've been so generous throughout this COVID crisis. We appreciate it. And we ask you to continue to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.